the talk that we're going to be hearing today from David Yeager. Uh, I might get in a little bit of trouble for this. Um, you know, in addition to being a uh, professor of psychology at the University of Texas Austin, um, I think David's like the best developmental psychologist there is. I should say something qualifying, like of his generation who studies that, but. David's the best, and I'm so excited um, that he also uh, brought uh, some of his collaborators on um, new work. So you're um, being rewarded uh, not only with a riddle, but also with um, results that David hasn't presented otherwise. So um, David, thank you so much for joining BCFG. Yeah, thanks a lot. It's great to be here. All right. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, thanks for joining. I'm David Yeager. Um, I have a bunch of collaborators and funders on this work that I'll present. Uh, it's a real team effort. And I'm excited to share our newest data, much of which was collected during the pandemic. And I'm looking forward to your questions uh, about the future of this work. And we have a few of the collaborators on to answer methodological questions uh, and so on. Uh, so we all know that the global economy is going through a period of transition. Uh, the jobs that people were prepared for or were expecting are disappearing. Uh, this was happening before the current pandemic. But during the last six months, millions of lower skilled jobs have gone away permanently. The jobs that are appearing increasingly require advanced technical skills in subjects like math, science, and programming. Uh, but the vast majority of Americans are not prepared to acquire those skills. This poses a barrier to participation in the labor market and creates stress. In fact, math and programming are two of the most anxiety inducing fields, even though they hold the keys to economic success. That anxiety causes people to feel overwhelmed by and avoid advanced technical training, which means that people get fewer skills, keeping them out of the better parts of the labor market and potentially adding distress even further. I also wanna point out that these demands are not distributed equally across the population. People with fewer economic and social resources and people facing discrimination are more likely to have been prevented from obtaining high quality academic preparation more likely to be affected by the current job shortage and more likely to experience daily traumatic stressors. In this talk today, I'll talk about that feeling of being stressed, a feeling of being overwhelmed and anxious about the demands on you, a feeling that stands in the way of skill development and well being and contributes to growing inequality. I want to know where that feeling comes from and what we can do about it. Now, there's a lot of talk these days about stress reduction. But as I've just described to you, people don't need to escape their stress, for instance, by staying in their comfort zone. They need to stay engaged with educational experiences so they can be prepared for their new economic reality. What we wanted to know in our research was, what messages can we send people to help them be resilient in the face of stressful confrontations with advanced technical training? Our approach is grounded in a lesson that social psychologists and affective scientists have been emphasizing for decades now that the way you appraise or construe the demands that are placed on you can have a big impact on how effectively you respond to and navigate those demands. And I wanna focus on two particular types of appraisals. Both are gonna be familiar to you, uh, but the contribution of this work uh, that I'll tell you about is the recognition that these two types of appraisals are complementary in fundamental ways. And that appraisals can be changed by targeting underlying often implicit beliefs that people, ha people have. The first critical appraisal is of the probable cause of an event or a stressor itself. So if you're taking a challenging math test, you might appraise your struggle as a sign that you're not smart at this. If you don't feel like you're the kind of person who can become good at math, of course, the requirement that you take a math test can induce a lot of anxiety. The second critical appraisal is how you interpret your stress response, that anxiety that you're feeling as a result of the stressor. Do you interpret that anxiety as a sign that you're about to fail? Or do you interpret it as your body's natural response when you need to rise to meet a difficult challenge? If you make the former appraisal, you start to feel what Ali Crum at Stanford has described as feeling stressed about being stressed. You may even wonder, why am I the kind of person who gets so stressed about a thing like this? You can start to see how these two appraisals feed into each other, right? So focusing first on this initial appraisal, if you think math is something you're bad at and can't get better at, the inevitable response is hopelessness. And few things are more awful than feeling like you're bad and can't get better at something that's really important to you. And of course, if you feel hopeless about your prospects of improving, it's hard to interpret that anxious feeling, those butterflies in your stomach, as anything other than as a sign of your impending failure. 
At this point, maybe you're expecting to fail. And stress researchers often talk about stress responses in terms of demands and resources. And you can see how the profound hopelessness that results from these two complementary appraisals would leave people feeling like no amount of resources can help them overcome the demands they're facing. Now, stress researchers have also described how when the mind expects failure, then the body prepares for damage and defeat. First, your blood vasculature constricts, keeping more blood centrally and less blood in your extremities. This, of course, is the holdover from our ancestors who primarily faced physical stress, so preparing for damage and defeat meant minimizing blood loss. Next, people feel more negative affect, anxiety, and avoidance motivation because you don't expect you can be successful. People then go on to underperform because working memory is loading up with worries and because they're getting less, less oxygenated blood in the brain. Now, imagine a more resilient pattern of appraisals at each of these two steps. First, you can have a different appraisal of the stressful event itself. For instance, if you're freed of the belief that math is something you can't get better at, then even if you're struggling with a math test, you aren't stuck feeling hopeless. Uh, at worst, this, this will reveal areas where you can improve and learn. And second, if you believe it's possible to improve, then the idea of, of feeling anxiety uh, that you're having uh, could potentially be harnessed to help you. And that's, that's no longer out of the question for you. It becomes possible to think that your stress response is like energy, energy that can help you perform better, not a sign that you're gonna fail. This leads to what stress researchers have called challenge type stress responses. When your mind expects you to rise to meet the challenge, then your body pumps more blood, giving you more oxygenated blood to your extremities and to your brain. You may feel less negative affect, more positive affect. Rather than feeling anxious, you may feel confident and approach motivation and performance can go up. Now, critically, these two appraisals can work together. Returning to the contemporary economic environment, first, you need to see the demands of advanced technical skill training to be positive and able to be overcome. Then, when the demands get to a point where they might be too much to handle, as they inevitably should if you're doing things at the frontiers of your abilities, then um, if you're given or have a healthy interpretation of your stress response, you can see how your body's natural way of responding to stress can kick it into high gear. Now, I don't mean to imply that people have the second response fo focused appraisal spontaneously, but instead I wanna argue that once you believe change is possible, then the prospect of using your stress response to meet the challenge comes into the realm of possibility. Unfortunately, the single biggest scientific barrier to overcome here is that it's exceedingly difficult to change chronic appraisals across many situations over time. Most experiments give people a new appraisal of a specific situation, but that appraisal does not transfer to new situations. We propose that the transfer problem can be overcome by focusing on situation general belief systems that create patterns of appraisals across places and time. The reason that there are two types of uh, beliefs that can chronically change appraisals across situations. The first is an event-focused belief, such as growth versus fixed mindsets. These are beliefs about the underlying causes of events, such as personal struggle. The second is a response-focused belief, such as stress can be enhancing versus debilitating beliefs. Uh, Ali Crum developed that work. Uh, these are beliefs about the meaning of your affective responses to stressful events. Our contribution to the literature is to recognize that these two beliefs have an obvious symbiotic relationship. One helps you engage with something that will be stressful. The other helps you engage with the inevitable stress that's a byproduct of doing that. Because of that complementary relationship, we realize it's possible to teach these beliefs in tandem with, with, with each other, each reinforcing the other. The combined beliefs can help people overcome two different terrifying barriers to skill development. The first is, oh no, I can't do this. And the second is, even if I did do it, I'd be so stressed and overwhelmed that I would fail. Combined, they can address two of the most daunting worries that people have when they decide whether to take on a new endeavor. This particular combination of mindsets comes uh, from past correlational work that we did, which found that the combination of these two beliefs when measured seem to predict mental health and stress reappraisal processes more strongly than one or the other. And so building on that, we developed what we call the synergistic mindsets intervention to change both of these simultaneously. This intervention draws on two established messages. Uh, and our innovation was in finding ways to deliver both of these mindsets together uh, in a single coherent message. Um, so I have slides with the exact intervention text that I'd be happy to share in the Q&A, but for now, here's a summary. 
So um, uh, the growth mindset is the idea that abilities can be developed. And then understanding that helps people to see struggles as a path to improvement, not a sign of inability. Uh, the stress can be enhancing mindset is the idea that your stress response can be useful for enhancing performance. And understanding that allows people to harness their stress response to develop their abilities. Here's a very uh, brief excerpt. Uh, participants read in our study, uh, when we struggle to accomplish something we care about, whether it's a difficult math problem, a challenging athletic or musical skill, or an important personal goal, we get anxious. We think of that as a bad, as a bad thing, a feeling that gets in the way when we're trying to perform. But the truth is that stress response is exactly what your brain needs to take on difficult challenges and learn from them. Uh, now it's critical to realize that uh, the intervention doesn't just tell people what uh, to think. Uh, and it's not enough to just give them information and expect people to know what to do with it. Instead, people need to be guided through these ideas and given an opportunity to imagine themselves putting them into practice. And we do this with some well-known techniques for internalization of new beliefs. First, we present people with scientific information uh, from sound authorities. Next, we provide people with stories from older students who learned the same information and acted on it in the past. This creates the right descriptive norm for the message. Finally, we give people the chance to describe how they'll put the mindsets into practice in the form of a persuasive letter written to others who are undergoing struggle. This is called a saying is believing exercise. Um, overall, the, the intervention takes about 25 minutes, it's self-administered, and all the studies I'll show today, uh, the intervention was done over the computer. So uh, we'll have five studies and we have uh, 10 minutes, so um, we should have plenty of time. Um, and uh, now, one thing I'm not, you, one thing you may be anticipating that I'm not gonna show is a two by two design, testing all combinations of the two mindsets. Now, the reason why is that the synergistic nature of the mindsets was our central interest here. So we focus on either providing it or not. And the correlational and moderation analyses I'll show support our interpretation. It doesn't mean we're not interested in a two by two in the future. All right, so uh, very quickly, two very initial studies asked whether it's possible to administer this synergistic mindsets intervention um, and uh, understand immediate effects on appraisals. So the first study I'll show you is a pre-registered experiment conducted in the Character Lab Research Network with about 2,500 adolescents, eighth to 12th grade. It was done this fall, um, just uh, about a month ago. Um, so in the middle of the pandemic, during election season and so on, uh, most of the students we think were in hybrid uh, learning environments. Uh, participants went to a, a website, a link, they were given the treatment or the control. After the treatment or control exercise, the control just provided kind of inert information about the stress response in the brain, by the way. Um, and uh, after the intervention or control, participants reported their stress beliefs, and then they responded to a scenario. Um, earlier on the survey, they had been asked what their most stressful class is. And uh, as at post-test, they were asked to imagine getting a hard, unexpected assignment in your most stressful class. And then they were asked a series of appraisal items. For instance, do you think your body's stress response would help you do well on that assignment or hurt your performance on that assignment? So that's a hypothetical scenario. It's nice because we can control it. Uh, we all also can look at a broad range of young people in, in the real world, uh, but uh, it's, not a, it's not an authentic stressor. And so in study two, uh, what I'll show you is a, a study where we capitalize on uh, a classroom that gave uh, really hard timed quizzes each week. Um, this is in uh, an intro psych class at a large public university. And so undergraduates in the class were randomized to the treatment or control in the fall of 2019. And then uh, one to two days later, and then again, three to four weeks later, when students took a challenging timed quiz, uh, they took the quiz and right afterwards they were asked for their appraisals. For instance, uh, do you think your body's stress response was helping you on this quiz or hurting your performance on this quiz? Uh, well, we find that I'm gonna, all the analyses I'm gonna show you are Bayesian analyses, fully, uh, fully Bayesian. Uh, the the re results are all significant using uh, traditional um, frequentist analyses, but I'll, I'll tell you in a minute why we, we opted for the fully Bayesian approach. These are plotted treatment effects in standard deviation units. In the first study, what you see is that the intervention changes beliefs as you'd expect, uh, but it also changes appraisals of uh, a, a hypothetical uh, challenging assignment in your most stressful class. In study two, what you see is a, a change in beliefs at immediate post-test, also a change in appraisals of the quiz 
uh, one to three days later. You see a little bit of a decay three weeks later, but the effect size uh, three weeks later is essentially identical to the appraisal effect size from study one. So it's around 0.2 standard deviations. Um, so a little bit of a decay, but not that meaningful. Um, so these are self-reports. This, this tells us initially when people receive these beliefs, do they make different appraisals that are known to predict uh, different patterns of coping? The answer is yes. But it's more interesting, I think, to start looking at how the body responds to an acute stressor to find out whether these beliefs really are setting in motion different uh, patterns of stress responses. And to do that, we implemented uh, a standardized stress test called the Trier Social Stress Test developed by Clemens Kirschbaum. Um, the way the TSST works is participants are brought in the lab and their uh, physiology is measured at baseline. Uh, and then they're given the intervention or the control. Um, and then they are notified that they will be asked to give a public speech to a, a number of evaluators who will judge their performance in about five minutes. And if they're hooked up to the, to the physiology um, monitoring equipment at that time. Uh, so they have to prepare this extemporaneous speech. Then they deliver it in front of a panel of judges who are trained to be unsupportive. So they're kind of giving flat affect. So they're sitting here with the clipboard um, and um, just kind of staring at you and taking notes. Um, the, they're, they're not giving negative feedback, but there's no positive reaction. Uh, the speech people are asked to give is a speech about what makes someone popular and admirable uh, in their age group. And so of course, it's a little bit stressful to feel like you're not doing well in a speech like that in front of peers. Uh, immediately after giving the speech, people are asked to do mental math. So they're asked to uh, count backwards from 968 in increments of 17 as quickly as they can. And they're stopped and corrected if they make any mistakes by the same uh, panel of judges. And last, uh, people, there's a recovery period. So people recover to baseline. And what you're looking for is a kind of increase in stress, especially during the speech period, and then a recovery to baseline afterwards. Um, we should note everyone here is debriefed. Um, so they're given a hug and a comfort animal if they need it at the end. Um, so what I'm gonna show you here is what's called total peripheral resistance. This is the amount of constriction in the vasculature, it's a sign of uh, keeping blood centrally and not in your extremities. Uh, it's an indicator of threat type responses. What you see is that uh, there's a kind of peak in the speech period, as you'd expect, that's typically the most stressful, and it tends to recover over time uh, to baseline. Uh, what happens in the randomly assigned treatment group, what you see is a pretty meaningful reduction in um, stress responses. So that's about uh, 0.6 standard deviation decrease during the most stressful period. Uh, and I'm happy to get into the technical details of this in the Q&A, um, but the most important thing to notice is that across the board, treated people are showing more of a challenge type response and less of a threat type response. And not only is there a main effect, but, but we're getting the largest effects in moments where it's needed most. It's also the greatest uh, among women and people with negative prior mindsets, especially looking in that speech period. Now, that although that makes um, a lot of sense, what I just showed you amounts to a pair of three-way interactions and then with a highly nonlinear effect. Um, in a typical frequentist analysis like this, there can be any number of analytic choices which might make a result like that appear uh, from chance alone. So I wanna take a moment to highlight uh, a new statistical method that was developed by Jared Murray, who's on the line, called Targeted Smooth Bayesian Causal Forest. This is an extension of a, a previous model called Bayesian Causal Forest we've used in other studies. Um, and, and the most important thing to notice is that there's a separate covariate function where um, it, it uses BART uh, priors to decide the optimal um, way to predict uh, Y using covariates. And that's separate from the moderator function, which is a pretty conservative uh, uh, sum of trees representation um, to try to shrink toward homogeneity and not capitalize on chance, but find true heterogeneity when it's there. And notably, this method has won a number of open public competitions uh, using machine learning methods to identify causal effects and moderators of effects. So all the results I'm showing here, which, which contribute to the Bayesian analysis and, and posterior summarization, uh, come from either this model or derivations of it. Now, um, I just showed you effects on uh, hypothetical appraisals, then uh, real world quiz appraisals, and then responses in the lab. What about effects over time? So in a study we did in a low-income school in Rochester, New York in uh, fall of 2019, 
We sampled just over uh, 115 uh, teenagers uh, who were um, uh, exclusively from populations that face economic hardship and exclusively students of color. Uh, and they were given the intervention or control and then uh, twice daily for five days, anywhere between two and six weeks post intervention, participants completed a daily diary. On the daily diary, they reported their social and academic stressors and how intense they were. And they reported their daily internalizing symptoms. So how bad they felt about themselves versus good about themselves. Um, on the left, what you see is the plotted uh, expected means um, and associated confidence uh, or, or posterior density intervals uh, for those means. And, uh, and the y-axis is how bad young people are feeling about themselves. What you see as expected is that the worse your stressors on a given day, the worse you feel about yourself. So increases on the y-axis, but that effect of the daily stressor is mitigated by the effect of uh, the treatment. So especially on uh, high uh, daily stress days, when, when you're looking on the right, there's a positive uh, treatment effect uh, or negative reduction in, in internalizing symptoms of 0.32 standard deviations. And that effect is about twice as large as the effect for low stress days. So again, what we're finding is larger effects among people facing greater stressors. We can do the same kind of uh, moderation analysis using the, the BCF model. And we again find that uh, females and people who start out with baseline negative mindsets tend to benefit the most. Now, one thing about daily diary studies is that the stressors themselves are measured at post-intervention. So you might wonder, is the treatment changing what stressors people are experiencing? And we, while we don't find any main effects at all on intensity of stressors as expected, and which is consistent with the assumption of stressor intensity being exogenous, we replicate this analysis using baseline chronic stress and we find the same effects. So people experiencing chronic stress, especially those who start out with prior negative mindsets tend to benefit the most from this treatment. Now, a, a final study is kind of interesting. We, um, is uh, we kind of accidentally did a study of stress and coping during COVID. And I say accidentally because we um, uh, took advantage of an opportunity to run an experiment in an intro psych course in the spring of uh, this current year. So in January, participants got the intervention or control group. We also measured their mindsets at baseline. And then a few months later, the COVID lockdowns happened. And previously scheduled, there was an anxiety uh, assessment in April. So we were able to use the anxiety assessment um, from this course to try to look at potential treatment effects on overall anxiety during the COVID lockdown. And what we found in the, in the BCF model is that among people with prior negative mindsets and also more strongly among females, there was a significant reduction uh, or meaningful reduction in overall anxiety systems, um, um, approaching 0.2 SD overall and um, it's about 50% greater than that for, for females. Um, so this to me suggests that even the one-time message uh, can under some conditions persist among people who are at the highest risk. Um, and it raises all kinds of other questions about the robustness of the effect and moderators that we wanna look into, but this is a really promising uh, piece of evidence that, that adds to the picture, I think. So to summarize, um, we think that uh, stressors are common. Um, stressors are neither good nor bad. Um, they can be good when it, they come from us uh, seeking to improve ourselves and facing new challenges from that. But appraisals can really be negative and derail us. They can take us off track if we're facing intensely negative stressors. Um, and so what the synergistic mindset intervention is designed to do is to change appraisals twice. First, the appraisal of, of the cause of the event itself, kind of why are you struggling? And next, your response. That response that becomes the new stressor and must be appraised as either helpful or not can also be helped uh, or hurt by beliefs. Now that's, we, we've shown this kind of for specific situations and begun to show how over repeated situations, the cycle might happen many times and over time lead to global stress and well-being outcomes. There are all kinds of questions. One set of questions uh, relates to workforce development and workforce participation. Could these treatment effects extend to who signs up to learn new skills online, who persists in your advanced training in the workplace and so on. And we have correlational evidence to suggest that these processes will play out. We have some initial laboratory experiments 
But the next phase of the work, I think we'll look at field experiments to promote uh, workforce development and participation by addressing stress beliefs. The other is, you know, we've only given the message once through one online intervention. Do people need reinforcements of that message? Do they need opportunities to act on it? What are the affordances? We've begun to play around with wearable tech to try to detect people's stress and give them messages in the moment. And we think that's promising, but it could also go really badly. For instance, if we appreciate the fact that most people think of stress as negative and we're telling them what their stress levels are, then you could see how that could feed into a negative cycle uh, if they're wearing uh, tech providing stress data. So what's the right and best way to provide people with their stress data so that they benefit from it rather than are harmed by it. So to conclude, um, you know, this is one project that's growing out of a new institute we've launched, the Texas Behavioral Science and Policy Institute. It's a multi-PI group and we're really focused on inequalities in the transition to adulthood. And we'd love to stay engaged with you all and answer questions and, and, and talk to you more about this work as it evolves. Thank you very much. Thank you, David. That was fantastic um, and really exciting to see these results and particularly exciting to see the ones that are so relevant to the crisis we're currently in, in the midst of. Um, so we have lots of great questions. I also am bad at using our chat box. I meant to have announcements queued up to go right at the end of your presentation, but I hit enter too fast. But anyway, there's, a, there's some announcements about the seminar. Take a look at those as you're gathering your thoughts and sending in questions. And I'm going to start peppering you with some of the great questions that have already come in, David. So the first one is actually just a clarifier. Um, so the first question I'm going to, we had come from a few different folks, including Don Moore, Dave Tannenbaum, um, Elizabeth Miller, um, lots of people who you may know. And, and they were all wondering about the intervention in study two and whether it affected quiz performance. Yeah, so um, the, the we pre-registered that that's kind of like the half-court shot DV in that study. Um, what we find is that for first-gen students, we find uh, significant benefits on the first quiz performance, um, but it, that we didn't really see clear patterns after that. So I think I think we'd have to know more to to work on that. In part because I think the next motivational process is not necessarily a kind of clarity of performance one, but more about um, opting into new challenging experiences. So I think a better DV would be, you know, would you like the harder quiz or the easier quiz? Um, so that's, that's what we're kind of thinking about next. Interesting. And I, I should also note that I know you brought um, a bunch of your collaborators with you today who might want to join us as panelists. So I see Chris and Jeremy and Jared all here. If any of you guys want to join, you should feel free to turn on your cameras and unmute and, and jump into this Q&A at any time. But if you want to hide, that's also fine. I know you're there, so you're invited. Um, so let me jump into a, another question from Don Moore. So we're going to do Don Moore questions back to back. Um, he had, I think, a, a great question, which is just um, worrying a little bit about whether or not if policymakers get really excited about your results, they could crowd out even more investment or more involved um, remedies for structural inequality and sort of wants to know how you think about that and how you, you know, what your message would be to policymakers um, on that topic. Yeah, well, I think that, that, you know, the kind of first mover for a lot of this work is to provide access and opportunity. And a lot of schools just don't, let's just take the, the case of, of high school math. A lot of schools don't offer advanced courses or enough seats in those courses or enough um, teachers that are well trained to teach those courses. Uh, and so, so the, I think the first step is creating opportunity. But even if you had those classes, lots of students would opt out of those classes in part because it feels really daunting to take the hardest possible math class. And so what we've been arguing is we have a framework we call mindset by context theory. And it's, it's developed with sociologists who specialize in, in inequality and reductions in inequality. The idea is to provide opportunities, but also inspire people to take advantage of them and help them to cope with them. So the work I presented today is kind of taking for granted that there are lots of opportunities out there. And then we need to think about the social psychology of it. You could have easily done another talk, which is lots of people have a good mindset, but, but aren't afforded opportunities. Okay, super helpful. Okay, so let me dive into one from, um, 
Michael Stralovitz. Uh, he wanted to know, he said you, he noticed you said that the effect was stronger for women, even controlling for prior mindsets in multiple studies, and wanted to know if you could say anything more about what maybe drives that difference if you know. It's curious yeah. about it. Yeah, I mean, I think it's, well, first, I just want to say that's kind of a, a, a benefit of doing this Bayesian machine learning moderation analysis, because if that would have shown up in the old way, it'd be like, well, we didn't really predict it. And is it really there? And like, you know, but here, what you do is you can pre-register your bucket of covariates and then a smaller bucket of moderators. And then it goes from prior to posterior once. And then you can summarize your posterior distribution and say, well, yeah, is it really there? Does it persist in the face of these other things? But you're not rerunning the model a bunch. And sure enough, and for the really consequential internalizing symptoms ones, there was a moderation by gender. It's kind of surprising in, in the studies of academic achievement, we haven't found that mindset effects are different by gender. I think here it's primarily gender as a proxy for greater risk for internalizing. And we know that especially in young adulthood, that's where you start to see really big differences in reports of anxiety and depression and daily internalizing symptoms for girls versus boys. I don't think it's anything about the message necessarily appealing to girls more or less. I think it's more um, a, a measure of, of risk. Um, ah, so it's more like a ceiling floor effect type thing to think like just giving us a- Yeah, boys are just less likely to say they feel bad about themselves in general. And also the effect of their daily stressors on feeling bad about themselves is not as big. Yep. Um, so I think it's more, and, and then, so then there are a whole bunch of questions about, well, why gender? You know, what are gender norms about being evaluated and comparing yourself to others doing uh, to this? Um, and, and so I think it's more a reflection of the societal trend than it is anything particular about, about gender. Got it. Okay, well, that's really interesting. And also maybe that'll give some of the other researchers listening ideas for things they could do as, as follow-up studies. Um, yeah. Here's another question from uh, Alana Brody. Um, she wants to know if you think timing would be critical to the success of this intervention. She wants to know if you should intervene right before a stressful incident so that people can get immediate feedback for this mindset shift. And if so, if you have recommendations for the right time to intervene in schools or other environments. Yeah, that's actually a great question. So uh, in general, I try to intervene early on after a new transition when the world still feels new and different and when there's opportunities for people to be opting in or opting out of things and also when things are kind of uncertain. And I think that's a, a good time for a new mindset to start a new habit of thinking. Um, so there's a hypothesis about openness to mindset change. There's a hypothesis about kind of environmentally, do you need the mindset at that time? But then the other hypothesis is about uh, where can you use the mindset once and then find confirmation that it was useful for you in your context and then have it be used again. So that's more about starting a recursive process. And all three of those are really interesting hypotheses that you'd have to do experiments to vary timing to really look at. Um, so I, I would say for now, from like a policy perspective, I would use the interventions in moments of vulnerability uh, when people have the chance to continue using it. But the scaled up studies should try to vary those contexts and understand where do you change appraisals and then the effect stops and nothing else happens versus where do you change appraisals and then they can become reinforced and afforded over time. Really interesting. Okay, and I'm realizing I'm doing a crummy job of bringing in your collaborators and my moderation. So let me just say before I go to the next question, Jeremy and Jared, if there's anything you want to chime in and say in response to any of the questions we've been talking about so far, I would love, I would love to know. I'm sure the audience guess, would. I mean, one thing, timing-wise, kind of the last question and the exam performance questions from before, um, with some of these stress reappraisal, stress mindset interventions, very often they're delivered like in an exam context, like right before someone takes an exam. And so they're presented with the immediate acute stressor in that moment. And there we often do see some performance effects um, coming out. And so that's sort of the, the timing, the context, they do matter. And so once someone sort of gets that immediate feedback that's, that this is successful, they can kind of take that with them in an easier way uh, moving forward. That's just one very small insight, I guess. Great. And we've got Chris. And I feel like there's a beard thing going here, David, that you didn't get the memo on. <laughs> <laughs> mine, mine is accidental. Mine is not intentional. Oh, well, you have a ways to go, Jeremy, to, to keep up with the rest of the crew. <laughs> um, mine, mine is also accidental. <laughs> okay. Um, 
everybody looks great. Just I felt like I had to mention that. Okay, Jared and Chris, is there anything you guys want to chime in to say or add to the conversation we're having so far before I go to the next question? Nope. Okay. All right. I'm going to plow forward. And, and the next one actually is pretty open-ended. So maybe this will spur some discussion among all of you. Um, one of our listeners was just interested in uh, whether you could elaborate a little bit more on Bayesian analysis and the, uh, um, and you know, what you're doing there how, methodologically, why you think it's an advance over what's been done before and what our listeners should know about it. Yeah. Great. Why don't I give the non-statistician answer and then let Jared also answer. I'll just say from, from a behavioral science perspective, um, I'm just kind of dissatisfied with how we do our analyses. I mean, the, 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 once, once, we, once we grant that any intervention will be moderated and will work differently for different people, then we're a world in which we have to have all kinds of complex interactions and then recenter the model and test it plus in one SD and figure, like where are the simple effects showing up? Where are they not? And are all the moderators linear? Are they nonlinear? And then just the, the, the invitation to chase noise is so great. And it's such a mismatch with what we think is the truth, which is that human behavior and thinking is complicated and, and it's maybe studyable, but it's complicated. And so what drew me to the BCF model is the idea that you can just specify a handful of covariates that might be a lot, but a separate smaller bucket of moderators and not have to make decisions about functional form or where you're gonna cut, but allow the, the posterior distribution uh, to be a place where you can figure out what happened with the data. And so, uh, Jared, I want to let you also kind of answer uh, that, but I would say that's that's what was so appealing for it uh, about it for me. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great summary. Um, I would sort of reframe the question a little bit um, in terms of, you know, we're usually not thinking about Bayesian analyses versus frequentist analyses if you're talking to a statistician. Um, I would sort of frame it as Bayesian analyses versus classical analyses. Um, and I feel like it's important to make that distinction because Bayesian inference, Bayesian analyses can actually have really good frequentist properties. Um, so one of the things that's happening behind the scenes uh, in the, the model that David's talking about is we sort of specified a model and a prior distribution that is kind of carefully uh, including information about treatment effect heterogeneity that says things like similar people are more likely to have similar treatment effects. Sounds like a totally reasonable thing to say, um, but it's really not built into a lot of classical analyses. Uh, and that's just one more source where you can get confused by noise and chance variation in the data. Um, and we can sort of guard against that with uh, these carefully specified prior distributions. And the upshot is that you actually get inferences that tend to behave better over repeated sampling or over repeated experimentation. And I think in the long run, um, it's gonna be sort of borne out uh, as we accumulate more and more evidence about these treatment effects. So I wouldn't really put it up as Bayes versus frequentist. I put it up as like these Bayesian analyses and specifically these um, uh, sort of more sophisticated Bayesian machine learning methods that we're working on um, versus kind of more classical methods based on linear models, refitting models, which could also be Bayesian too. Um, but it's really just an invitation to, uh, or, or sort of a, a demand to consider a bunch of different competing specifications. How do you tell which one's better than the other? How do you reconcile your inference at the end of the day? Um, you get yourself in trouble if you kind of use your data to pick your model and then use the same data to make inference uh, and all this back and forth. It's really just sort of nightly, nicely uh, addressed by these Bayesian machine learning methods. Great. Yeah, um, and I'll say it's, it's also just simpler because the pre-registration for the Bayesian machine learning model can be like half a page. It's not like six pages of which follow-up tests are you gonna do. Um, so I think the pragmatic benefits as well. Great, okay. Um, I am going to read a comment from Marty Seligman and see what, what it inspires you guys to think about, because it's not exactly a question, but I'm curious how you'll react. Uh, so he said, the most obvious effect of believing in helplessness and hopelessness is not trying as hard. Um, lower voluntary response, um, lowered voluntary response initiation. Self-reported low esteem and biological effects are smaller and to my mind, secondary. So what are your, what are your thoughts on that comment and, and uh, how it relates to your work? Yeah, well, so uh, Marty's totally right that um, when people experience intense threat, one of the first things they want to do is drop the stressor, right? So that so the reason I frame the talk in terms of the fact that we need to continue acquiring these skills if we're going to have a place in the economy is that that's the dilemma. 
when we take on things that feel harder than what we can do and we feel helpless to overcome them, we're tempted to drop them. What we actually need to do is continue and embrace them. So that so the, the stress reduction approach is the, the, the drop, drop hard things approach. The stress resilience approach is continue persisting. Now, he's also right that if you look in the, in the lab, there actually could be three different types of responses. One would be a challenge response where you're engaged with a stressor and you're embracing it. Another would be a threat response where you're kind of engaged with a stressor, but you feel like you're failing. But the last would be an avoidance response where you just don't even try to give the speech. You give up on the mental math. And what we tend to see is that there's a subgroup of people who start out with intense threat and then they peter off because they just quit altogether. Um, so I, I think that, that quitting is a tremendously important dependent variable. And we're seeing it again and again when uh, people are trying to skill up workers who have lost their jobs in the pandemic. There are all these new opportunities to teach yourself new skills online and people avoid. Um, and they do for good reasons. Maybe they have a lifetime of math scar tissue and math anxiety. They don't wanna learn programming after they got laid off from a, a service job. Uh, so I think that um, what Marty's saying is, is, is maybe one of the most important things for the field to contend with. Um, I, I disagree that the physiology is unrelated to it because I think the physiology is an antecedent. People experience threat and then they, well, then they avoid. Uh, but but I, think it's, I think his comment is right on. Chris, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, I was just going to add that the hopelessness really sort of gets to the heart of the complementarity between these two mindsets, right? The idea is that if you feel hopeless, then the, the, the notion of overcoming the challenge, the notion that, that your stress could be enhancing is kind of irrelevant because the stress becomes something to escape, not something, not, not something to, to manage or, or, or harness. Um, and so I, I think sort of related to what David said, which is basically, sure, the first effect of hopelessness is people give up is right. And the question is like, what happens if you can stop people from doing that? Then the next challenge comes, which is how do I deal with this anx anxious feeling I'm having? Really great. Um, thank yeah, so you all. Oh, oh, one, yeah, more, sorry, I mean, one more quick insight that I think is <laughs> really great. relevant to this. Um, we have some work in a review right now uh, with stress awesome optimization ideas in community college students. And one of the strongest predictor of attrition Oh, I, think, I think we just really you just cut out when you said the strongest predictor of attrition. Oh, it's the best part. So the strongest <laughs> predictor of attrition in these students was the physiological response they were having. Um, it was neuroendocrine markers of threat. And what they were doing is they were having this extreme negative stress response on test days. And we saw those those of the class and so i just keep freezing don't i I'm yeah just, you're freezing but i just want to i just want to double click on that because that's a that's that's exactly the kind of population we're thinking about adults going to community college to uh, gain advanced technical skills having to take remedial math they're confronting these kind of math traumas their initial neuroendocrine profile of threat is predicting whether they eventually drop out and so we want to know what can you say to help people early on in that process to to in, stay engaged with that stress. To inoculate so that they can succeed. That's great. Um, this was so interesting. Thank you all for joining for the panel and to everybody who joined us to listen. Um, I'll just make my sort of final announcements as we say goodbye. Uh, next Monday, we have our last seminar of this year, though we will be, this has been such a huge success, we will be announcing a lineup for 2021 and, and keeping this going since we're all still online. Um, next Monday, will be Cass Sunstein from Harvard as our closer presenting Want to Know, an international survey and as a bonus event this Friday at 4 15 p.m. you can watch me introduce Kevin Volpe and Richard Thaler to have a conversation um, a wide-ranging conversation about the future of behavioral science um, and finally there's a survey we we'll, we sent it out actually in today's reminder email so you can double check that but it's also in the chat here to help us improve the seminar so let me just thank David and all of his collaborators again this is so great um, we really appreciate your time and an important work and um, enlightening us with it thanks guys <laughs>